In this concluding message, we draw insights on the beauties of holiness. True worship always happens in the beauty of holiness. Holiness is God's beauty and glory displayed through us. We are to be willing volunteers arrayed in the beauty of holiness in order to advance His kingdom. Holiness is our state of anticipation and readiness to see Him face to face. Let's turn our Bibles please to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to just read a few verses before we uh, rise up to make our declaration together this morning. 1 John chapter 4. Verses 4 through 6. First John chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. It says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. Verse 6, we are of God, he who knows God hears us, he who is not of God does not hear us, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I just want to highlight something there, in verse 5 he says, they are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. So they are of the world. And they speak as of the world. Next verse. We are of God. Now it's not stated there, but it's implied. Therefore, we speak as of God. And those who are of God, they hear us. They understand what we're saying. So, if you want to generalize this, you could say there are two kinds of languages. Only two languages in the world. The language that is... So what's your language? What language do you speak? Do you speak as of God or do you and I speak as of the world? When you speak as of God, we speak aligned to the word of God. We speak aligned to the ways and the thoughts of God. We speak from God's perspective. When we speak as of so it's implied that we are of God. So we speak as from God. And those who are from God, they understand us. They hear us. And notice what he said in verse 4. He said, You're of, you are of God. You are of God. And because you're of God, he says, you have overcome them. I mean, it's like the game's over. You have already overcome. So you speak as a person who has already overcome. You're of God. You have overcome. Because you've got the greater one living in you. And the game's over. You have overcome. So you speak as someone who has overcome. Speak that way. You're of God. Amen? So. Maybe we need to change our languages. Start speaking as of God rather than speaking as of the words. And indeed, he says, you are of God. You have overcome. So we can begin to speak as people who have overcome. As overcomers. Speak as from God. So let's rise up to our feet this morning. We're going to make our declaration. We're going to say what God has said about us. We're going to speak as from God. Speak aligned to the word of God. Let's lift our Bibles high up in the air. Say this out loud, bold and strong with me, please. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I am saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I am a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. 
And to him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you turn around to people next to you, please. Shake hands. People in front of you, beside you, behind you. Smile at them. And you may be seated, please. All right, this morning is our last message in this series on, on the holiness of God. So last several Sundays, I think four Sundays, we've been talking about the holiness of God. I'm going to quickly review some of the things we've covered and just share a few more insights, a few more thoughts on the holiness of God uh, as we conclude this series. So let's quickly review. You know, in part one of the series on the holiness of God, we obviously began with, with our focus on God as, as being a holy God. And we talked about the fact that God's core nature is holiness. And every other aspect of His nature is, is uh, undergirded with holiness. Where we said that God will never do, uh, any, any expression of God's nature will never contradict holiness. So God in His love will never do something that contradicts holiness. God in His mercy will never do something that contradicts His holiness. God in His goodness will never do anything that contradicts His holiness. Because every facet of God's holiness is touched or undergirded with holiness. Every facet of His nature. And we also said in the very beginning that God wants that holiness to be reproduced in us. He is holy, so He tells us, be holy. He wants that to be reproduced in us and revealed through us. In part two of this message, we considered the fact that God in heaven is worshipped by this one aspect, holiness. He's, he's worshipped as holy, holy. There's only one aspect of His nature that is expressed or, or, or used in worship like this. His holiness. Holy, holy, holy. Emphasizing that everything about God is holy. His, uh, the angels around Him are holy angels. His, the house where he, uh, where he dwells is called a holy tabernacle. He adorns His house with holiness. And uh, so we said that the only way we can ever approach such a holy God is through the atonements. Because of the blood of Jesus and because of the righteousness that God himself has given to us. That's the only way we can enter the holy presence of God or the presence of such a holy God. So in part three of this series, we, we then discuss on his holiness in me. How does God go about reproducing that holiness in us? The fact that God says, I am Jehovah Mekedes. I am the Lord your sanctified. So that's wonderful to know that God doesn't say, go get sanctified and then come to me. He says, no, I will do it for you. I am your sanctifier. I do it for you. And so we saw the twofold provision God has made to enable you and me to be holy. First of all, on the cross, he broke the power of sin. Amen? So I'm just reviewing here. So for us, our life of holiness begins at the cross because the power of sin has been broken. You know, uh, this is just a personal story, but this goes way long back when I was a teenager. Okay, I got saved, and the next big quest was, how do I live holy? And I used to read these biographies of people, you know, like Charles Finney and all those, who had these great experiences. They went out of the jungles, and they had these great experiences with God, and they came out sanctified. You know, they should refer to that as a second experience. So you have salvation, but you need the second experience of sanctification. And so I thought, I needed this experience. So I was after an experience. You know, and that's the problem with the church. We're always after some experience. And so I was searching for this experience. I would kneel down in the garden hoping, you know, hey, I can't go up to a mountaintop, but at least I can kneel in a garden or something. I, I would, I said, God, I need the second experience that, 
you know, these, these writers are talking about. Until one day, I read Romans chapter 6. And the revelation came, the understanding came. Hey, the work has already been finished on the cross. He broke the power of sin. You don't need a second experience. You just need, the Bible says you just need to reckon. That means take it as finished. Reckon it to be so. It's done already. Amen? So then I realized, I, I don't need a second work of grace. No. The work has been done. It's on the cross. I need to live out based on the finished work of Christ on the cross. And so then I started making my declaration saying, sin will not have dominion over me. Why? Because Jesus broke the power of sin on the cross. That's a little side story. But So that's the thing. God does His work. Uh, he makes it possible for you and me to live in holiness because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. We need to take it and embrace it. The power of sin over my life has been broken. So I'm not going to tolerate anything that dominates me. Because the Bible says, sin will not have dominion over you. So you live out of that finished work. You're not searching for an experience. You're living out of what Christ has already done for us. So the second way that God makes it enab uh, enables us uh, to live out uh, uh, this life of holiness is He makes us a new creation. This new creation inside of us is created in the, right, in, in the image of God in righteousness and true. So the man on the inside, if you're the born again man, the person that you are on the inside is a person or the, the new person, the new man is created in righteousness and holiness. So this is going to be natural, so to speak, for you and me to walk in holiness. Amen? So he has done that work. He's provided that for us. So now when we came into the message last Sunday, part four of perfecting holiness, how does God enable us to perfect holiness? We talked about the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of holiness, He sanctifies us. He empowers us to crucify the flesh, to get rid of the, 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 the filthy things, get rid of it. And the Word of God has sanctifying effect. As you and I open our hearts up to the Word of God, it purifies us, sanctifies us. And thirdly, we said, our response to God's call of holiness is that we consecrate our self. You all remember that? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> the good thing is all these messages that are available on our church website, so you can just go back and listen to it over and over again. Let it soak into you, settle in your heart. So consecration is so important. That's our response to God, to His invitation to holiness. Uh, sometimes consecration is painful. Like we saw last Sunday, Jesus talked about, you know, if anything causes you to sin, you've got to pluck it out or cut it off. So it, it, it is painful sometimes, but that's our response. In order to walk in holiness. And we talked about the rewards, the blessings of holiness uh, as we went along. So today, uh, we're going to talk about the beauty of holiness. And this is not necessarily, uh, 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 you know, a, a single train of thought, or just random thoughts here put together, but centered around this aspect of the beauty of of holiness. We find this phrase, you know, the beauty of holiness used a, a, a few times uh, uh, in the Bible. And so I thought it would be interesting just to uh, look at various aspects of the beauty of, of holiness as we bring this series on the holiness of God to conclusion. In our very first message, we mentioned this. We said uh, there are certain descriptors that I use in the Bible uh, th that use other language to describe something about God. For instance, there is the phrase that you and I would see often in the Bible, the arm of the Lord or the hand of the Lord. And so that phrase, the hand of the Lord, is used to refer to the, the power of God. So the hand of the Lord, the arm of the Lord, talks about the power of God. You also read about the eyes of the Lord. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro across the whole earth. So the eyes of the Lord are used to refer to us or talk to us about the omniscience of God. God knowing everything. The all knowing of God. Uh, we read about the, uh, the earth being his footstool, the feet of the Lord. Uh, talking about God's place of dominion, his dwelling place, his resting place. And so also 
we saw, we see in scripture that the beauty of the Lord refers to the holiness of God. You remember that? The beauty of the Lord refers to the holiness of God. And so, with that thought in mind, with that understanding, let's look at some scriptures that, that talk about the beauty of the Lord. And again, these are different, different thoughts here. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's not a single uh, uh, train of thought. But let's look at this. In Psalm 90, verses 16 to 17. Psalm 90, verses 16 and 17. This is Moses. Moses is praying for his people, this great a man of God is praying. He's saying, let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Now, it's interesting. In, in verse 16 and verse 17, you find two different Hebrew words. That are used in relation to the beauty of the Lord. In verse 16, it's, in this verse, it's translated glory. Uh, uh, let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. That word glory is a Hebrew word, hadar, which is also translated as beauty. Let your beauty appear to your children. And the word Hadar refers to God's splendor, His magnificence, His honor, His excellency. It, it deals more with who God is, it, the, the beauty uh, that is possessed by God. Let what you possess, the, the glory, the splendor that you possess, let that appear. And then in verse 17, he says, let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. It's a different word, Naom, which which talks about it, the delightfulness, the pleasantness. So Hadar deals with what God possesses. Naom deals with its effect on people when they see. Right? So, sorry for being a little crude, but if there's a lady here who is beautiful, she possesses beauty, but her effect on you is Naom. Simple? Okay, let's get spiritual now. <laughs> right? So he, that's the contrast there. Both words translated beauty. But the Hadar is beauty that is possessed. Naom is beauty that is recognized. That it's the effect it has on somebody who sees. And so in verse 17, it says, God, let your beauty be seen upon your people. When you and I walk in, in holiness, the beauty of the Lord our God is seen through us. Amen? When you and I walk in holiness, His beauty is seen upon us, seen in our lives. Remember we said the holiness of God is intended to draw us to Him. Another thought about the holiness of God is this. The Bible tells us in several places, and I'll make mention of a few. First Chronicles 16 and verse 29, it says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Again, Psalm 29 and verse 2, it says, you know, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 96 verse 9, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The same word Hadar is used in all these three verses. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness holiness so here's something important for us to understand that true worship can only take place in holiness true worship can only take place in holiness worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness now contrast this to uh, some of the things we see, I mean, we see this in scripture, we see sometimes in uh, some of the practices where uncleanness and immorality is actually associated with the worship of, so-called worship of God. I mean, in Corinth, you read about the Corinthian church where uh, there were temple prostitutes. 
So immorality was associated with the worship of gods and goddesses. But the scripture is telling us, God is so holy, you've got, he's got to be worshipped in the beauty of true worship. can only take place in holiness. And the holiness that you and I are talking about is not holiness that we have earned, like we've stated earlier. God himself imparts to us the righteousness and the holiness in which and out of which we worship him. Amen? But true worship can only take place in the context of holiness. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And so you extend this thought and we can also say that worship is simply the adoration of His beauty. Worship is the adoration of His beauty. You see this in First, Second Chronicles 20. And verse 21, he has an army that's going out to war. And it says here, when he had consulted the people, the king, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of praise. The word praise is halal. It simply means to celebrate. It's an exuberant celebration. Praise what? The beauty, the hadar, the, the, possess, the beauty that he possesses, the beauty of his holiness. So, worship is the adoration of the beauty that God possesses. You're just telling back to God how beautiful he is to you. Amen? God you are so beautiful. This is who you are to me. And so worship is an adoration of that, of the, of the beauty God possesses, His holiness. Just you do, just saying in your words, just singing in your song. David put it like this in Psalm 27 verse 4. He says, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of of the Lord. I want to gaze upon the beauty. And I hear that word beauty is the other word, Naom. That means its effect on the beholder. I just want to gaze upon God's beauty. How pleasant, how delightful it is to me. I want to be enthralled by it. So worship is an adoration of His beauty. You're just telling God how beautiful He is to you. Amen. So let's make a comment here that worship really should come out of reverence, not revelry. I think this is so important in our times when there is so much of sound and light and uh, all the dancing and everything that goes around with worship or praise and worship. Now, I'm not against it. There is a place. The Bible does talk about, you know, shout to the Lord and dance before the Lord and everything. Uh, and, and so there is a place for that. But we have to ask ourselves this very important question. All that I'm doing, the shouting, the dancing, is it coming out of a heart of reverence? Or is it coming for me to gratify my own need for enjoyment? You can say amen. <laughs> if I am doing all that because I want to enjoy, then that's revelry. It's not out of reverence in the heart. I mean, yes, it looks nice. Sounds nice. And then with all the lights and these things that we use these days, it looks great on television. <laughs> or on YouTube. You think worship is being offered. But God ain't, is not impressed by the lights and the sound of the music. He's looking at your heart. You and I might get impressed. But worship is not about impressing other people. Worship is about, am I touching the heart of God? Amen? 
Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not against dancing in, you know, exuberance. There is the place for exuberance in Scripture as well. David danced before the Lord with all his might. And the Bible tells us to shout to the Lord. And the Bible tells us to dance before God. So there is that definite place. But the question is, what is the heart condition when you're doing it? Is it from reverence? Or is it just a self-gratification? Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Worship cannot take place outside of holiness. Worship is an adoration of His holiness, of His beauty. And so let's always stay focused. First, reverence. And that expression, whatever it is, whether it's dance or kneeling or whatever expression, let it come out of our heart of reverence. Even if you're shouting, shout because there is reverence in your heart and you're overwhelmed by the greatness of God. Shout because of that. Or you're dancing, dance because there is reverence in your heart and you're really enjoying and celebrating God. Not to make yourself happy or feel good. Amen? Again, another random thought here associated with the holiness of God uh, is in Isaiah 57 and verse 15. It says here, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now think about this verse here. The high and lofty one whose name is holy. So God is saying, I am high and lofty. I'm in a place inaccessible, high and lofty. And I am the holy one. I'm unapproachable. I mean, that's how great God is. Who dwells, who inhabits eternity. All of eternity is contained in Him. So here is such a great God unapproachable, inaccessible, the high and lofty one. And God says, I dwell in the high and holy place. I am in this high place that is inaccessible, in this holy place that is so sacred, unapproachable. But I dwell here with the person who is of a contrite and humble heart. What's it telling us? When you and I walk with brokenness and humility, we get to sit with God in His high and holy place. We are now in a place of immunity. Are you with me? When we walk in brokenness and humility, we get to dwell with God in His high and holy place. So you see the, the importance of humility, of brokenness. What is brokenness? Brokenness is not being depressed all the time. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Brokenness simply means that I have a soft heart. I am touched with what touches the heart of God. That I'm not hard-hearted. That I'm moved by what troubles or pains others. That's brokenness. If we have a soft heart. And humility. Walking in humility. So when you and I walk with brokenness and humility, we actually get to dwell with God in His high and holy. Amen. A place that is inaccessible, unapproachable. You are now in a place of immunity. Safe and secure. Amen? Dwelling with God in His high and holy place. Another random thought here about how holiness and how you and I relate to that is in Psalm 110 verses 1, 2, 3. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. 
Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your you. Now, this passage is speaking prophetically, or a word in advance, about Christ's millennial reign on the earth, His rule and reign on the earth. We have it quoted in several places in the New Testament as well. And so it's, it's a foretelling that, you know, there will be a literal fulfillment of this when, when Christ will rule out of Zion and He will rule over the nations and uh, He will make His enemies His footstool. And, uh, and then it says in verse 3 about His people, His people will be volunteers. That means they will be willing. They will serve Him gladly, willingly. Your people will be volunteers in the day of your power when you are seated as ruler and so on. But what I want us to understand, and, 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 and this, I just want to make the statement here, that many things that I've spoken about Zion is spiritually fulfilled first in the church. It will be literally fulfilled in, with the people of Israel, with the Jews, Jews, with the people of Israel, but it's first fulfilled spiritually in the church. Some examples, Joel's prophecy of Joel chapter 2. It will be fulfilled literally with the people of Israel when God pours the Spirit out upon them. Zechariah 14 confirms that. But it, is spirit, it was spiritually fulfilled or is being spiritually fulfilled now by the church. We are experiencing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Same thing about the tabernacle of David, which Amos spoke about in Amos chapter 9. Amos said God will rebuild the tabernacle of David. It, was, it will be literally fulfilled with the people of Israel, but it is spiritually ful fulfilled with the church. Acts 15. James says, we are the tabernacle of David. So, same thing. This word today is spiritually fulfilled to the church. The church is called Zion. Hebrews 12 verses 22. Church is called Zion. So, we could take this and apply its spiritual fulfillment in the church. Today, the Lord is ruling through the church. Are you with me? So, we pray, thy kingdom... Your rule, your dominion through the church. So let's apply this to the church. Verse 3. Your people will serve you willingly. Your people will be volunteers in the day of your power. When you're ruling, your people are going to serve you willingly. So volunteers. <laughs> your people will be volunteers in the day of your power. But it tells us something about these volunteers. They will arise up with the womb of the morning, meaning they will at the breaking of dawn is another phrase we use it. So they arise up early and they have the dew of their youth. That means they come with strength, energy, zeal. But there's one more thing very important about these volunteers. They are clothed in the beauty of holiness. Right, so I did read many versions before I brought this explanation. So you just trust me on that, right? Verse 3. So it's talking about volunteers, God's people, who will serve Him willingly. They'll rise up early, the breaking of dawn, that is with the womb of the morning. They will serve Him with the dew of their youth, which means with their energy and zeal and everything. But they'll also be a people, as one version puts it, they'll be arrayed in holiness. They'll be clothed in the beauty of holiness. So think about this. You and I, as God's people, as we pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, and we want to be your instruments, God, through whom your kingdom comes, and you reign in the midst of your enemies, and you make your enemies your footstool. We want to be that, uh, and, uh, the agent of your rule and dominion in the hearts and lives of people. We're talking about in the spiritual sense, that in the hearts and lives of people, you reign. As we pray that, we must also understand, as volunteers, as people serving him willingly, we must be clothed in the beauty of Got it? All those who got it, say amen. <laughs> so volunteers clothed with holiness. And my last one. That holiness is actually an expression of our anticipation of His return. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him 
purifies himself just as he is pure. It says, beloved, he's coming. We are going to see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. So think about this. Suppose you were going to have some very important person visit you this evening at 7 o'clock. What would you and I do? I mean, we would get our homes clean, make sure at least the drawing room, <laughs> the living room is clean, you know, clean up the place, and before 7, you change into your good clothes, you want to look presentable, and uh, the more important the person is, the more grand your clothes will be, <laughs> you know. How much more for us to have this hope that Jesus is coming. He who has this hope, this anticipation, I'm going to see him as he is. It says he purifies himself even as he is pure. Even as he is pure. We purify our self. So we can say this. Holiness is an expression of our anticipation of Christ, meeting with Jesus. Now, the Lord willing, we might see him when he returns in the clouds, or we may pass through death and then see him. Either way, we are going to meet him. And, and John says, everyone who has this hope that you're going to see the Lord, you purify yourself even as he is. Amen? So let's just quickly review and we will close in prayer. So these are some random thoughts here on the beauty of holiness. We said that holiness, when we walk in holiness, God's beauty is seen upon us, seen through us. We worship God in the beauty of holiness. True worship cannot take place outside of this, outside of holiness. And worship itself is an adoration of His beauty, of the beauty of His holiness. It's an adoration. You are describing back to God how beautiful He is to you. That's worship. Worship must take place out of the same reference. Humility. When we walk with brokenness and humility, we actually dwell with the high and holy one. We dwell in that place of immunity. As volunteers who seek His kingdom advancement through our lives, we must be clothed with the beauties of holiness. And as people who anticipate His return, we walk in holiness because we have this hope. Amen? So I want us to pray that God, you give me a greater revelation. I know we've spent five Sundays talking about the holiness of God. It doesn't mean, you know, we've described everything there is. We probably scratched the surface and that's it. But I want us to pray and say, God, just give me a great revelation of your holiness and, and how I can walk in holiness. Amen? Help me. Help us, as the Bible says, we need to perfect holiness in the fear of God, out of reverence for God. Let holiness begin to touch Every aspect of our lives as we offer ourselves unto Him, back to Him. Let it begin to touch and permeate uh, various facets, areas of our lives. So I'm going to ask us to pray. Just call up worship team up, please. and uh, uh, Just take a few moments to pray and just ask the Lord, God, help me. Just give me a great revelation, a great understanding of your holiness and how that is to affect my life. Areas of my life that can come under the holiness of God. Let the beauty of God be seen in my life, in our lives. Father, we just thank you that you've made it possible for us to worship you in the beauty of holiness. That you are the Lord, our sanctifier. You are the one who makes us holy. You give us the grace, the ability 
to worship them. Father, we just welcome your refining, your purifying work in our lives. Even as your word says, that you sit as a refiner and the purifier of your people. And so do this work in us, we pray. Refine us, purify us, sanctify us. That our lives may truly display the beauty of the Lord our God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We're going to close and uh, we will dismiss. Those of you who would like to be prayed for, to be ministered uh, with the Holy Spirit baptism, uh, I just request you, you can come and be seated right up here. Once we dismiss, uh, we'll come down. We'll spend some time with you and pray for you. Uh, to receive the baptism the fullness of the spirit I'll uh, do that right here up in front after we dismiss let's close please the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God our Heavenly Father and the sweet fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with each of us always in Jesus name God bless you. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Have a good afternoon. Enjoy your Sunday and have a great week. God bless. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at abcwo.org. Also visit our website abcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.